Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name's Jeremy, and I'll be leading these uh, sessions this month. Nice to see you again. Uh, so these sessions are, um, as I mentioned last week, the purpose of these sessions is just to share some Buddhist uh, ideas and practices with you, and just for your interest and um, consideration. And um, as the Dalai Lama often says, if you um, like them and find them useful, then you can adopt them. And if they're not useful, then you can just forget about them. That's fine. Um, so, um, yeah, these are these are ideas and practices that um, are central to, to Buddhist tradition and uh, idea and practices that I found very helpful myself personally and uh, so I'll, I'll talk you through them and we can have some discussion and we'll do some meditation and uh, as the Buddha often said, you're welcome to uh, disagree with these ideas. It's good to, to challenge them. I think they bear, bear it well under, under um, scrutiny. So feel free to ask questions and disagree with anything I say. We can have some good discussions, we often have good discussions in, in these sessions. Uh, so we'll do some meditation and I'll talk a bit and then um, if questions come up, just um, we'll have question time at the end. Uh, so we'll do the same meditation that we did last week, which was a concentration meditation on the breath. Um, so we'll do the same practice, but I'll um, add a couple of extra things on. Uh, so as I was saying last week, meditation basically is defined as familiarizing your mind with a positive mental object. So it's something that has a positive effect on your mind, making it more calm and peaceful and relaxed and energetic, spacious, as opposed to something in you, occupying your mind that has a disturbing effect. So um, for example, when you're feeling strong animosity or hatred towards someone, if you examine your mind in, in that moment, you might notice that your mind is quite disturbed and churned up. Whereas at other times when you're thinking maybe um, sort of gentle or kind thoughts that you look, if you examine your mind, you might find that it's much more peaceful and calm and quiet. So that's the idea. That would be examples of a positive or negative mental object. So it's just defined based on the effect that it's having on your mind, basically. So that's what we're trying to do with meditation, is familiarize our mind with a positive object. And the idea, the reason why we do that is by familiarizing it becomes more familiar, or we could become more accustomed to that idea, and it comes to our mind more naturally. So it's like training your mind, familiarizing your mind with that way of thinking. So as you probably noticed, your mind is like a creature of habit, so it gets stuck in these these habitual sort of ruts or circular thoughts and patterns. And so we're trying to develop positive um, ways of thinking and habits, mental habits. So that's what we're doing. But in this meditation, we're just focusing on the breath, which is a neutral object. Neutral as in it doesn't generate attachment or aversion. It's something that we sort of feel neutral about. And we focus on a neutral object in order to to calm the mind down. So it's um, recommended as a a good practice for particularly for um, I guess us in our lifestyle because we're we're very busy and we have so many thoughts going on in our mind all the time. So this kind of constant discursive thought process which is going on, and even in our sleep we have you know busy dreams. So to sort of um, overcome this. Um, busyness, 
a practice like focusing on a neutral object like the breath is said to be very helpful. Um, and the two main tools, as I mentioned last week, for developing concentration are mindfulness, which in this context means remembering the object, holding it in, in your mind, keeping it in your mind, and um, introspection, which means observing your concentration to see whether your mind has wandered off or not. So these are the two main tools that we're using to develop concentration. So it's helpful to identify them in your mind and then try and get used to using them to hold the concentration. Um, and before we do that, we'll just do a short uh, meditation on motivation. So as I mentioned last week, the idea of motivation, which means um, it answers the question of why am I doing this? So if you ask yourself, why am I doing this meditation? So you probably answer by thinking, well, I'm trying to calm my mind. I want my mind to be more peaceful. And it's also beneficial for the people around me if my mind is more calm and peaceful. So I'm not just doing it for myself, but also for the people who, who I live with who have to live with me <laughs> and um, so I can be more beneficial, helpful to them and at least not harming them and hopefully being helpful to the people around me. So, and we try to make the motivation as sort of um, powerfully positive and expansive as possible. So you think I want to benefit as many people as possible by being, having a more calm and peaceful mind. That's the idea. And then the third part of this meditation, I just sort of want to explain it before we do it, so um, hopefully it's more clear. The third part is, um, as we were talking last week about afflictive states of mind, afflictive emotions, afflictive mental, normally I call them afflictive mental states or afflictive minds. So, um, and generally, we find that there's maybe one or two um, persistent or that are particularly strong in our, in our mind. I think for me at the moment it's probably um, work-related stress or stress in general. But it changes, you know, in different times in your life and sometimes it might be anxiety, depression or anger or strong attachment. But generally we have one or two that are quite strong in our mind. So just in your meditation at the end, I want you to try and bring that um, afflictive state of mind up just briefly. And I just want you to try and observe it. So the idea here is that you bring this to mind. So say it's, for example, anxiety or stress, you know, related to work, for example. So you just bring it to mind. And the idea is that you try and just observe it without getting involved with it. So again, this requires mindfulness and alertness. So the mindfulness is just sort of trying to observe that emotion or that state of mind. And the alertness is sort of trying not to get involved with that state of mind. You're just observing it sort of objectively without getting involved in it, which is quite tricky, a bit hard to do, but see how you go. Okay, so just sit in a posture which you find helpful for to concentrate, but it's also relaxing. So, however you feel comfortable. Normally people find it helpful to have their back straight so they don't get sleepy. And also your eyes just slightly open, also so you don't get sleepy, but also not too distracted by what's going on in the room around you. And just check that your whole body is relaxed. Relax all your muscles. And I find it helpful just to give yourself permission to stop thinking about all the things that 
you're normally thinking about, all the things that are going on in your life. So just give yourself permission to say, I'm not going to think about those things for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Just give yourself a break from that. And then bring your attention to your breathing, just breathe, breathing in and out. And then think about your motivation. Why, why am I doing this? Just ask yourself that question. So you're doing it because you want to develop um, a more calm mind, for example. So you might want to have more control over your mind, over your emotions. And also by having more control over your mind, then you have more control over your life in general and what's going on in your life. And then you also have more control over how you're affecting other people, the people who you share your life with. So starting with the people who are close to you, your family and friends, work colleagues. So you think I'm also doing this so that I can have, be more positive uh, effect on them. So I'm also doing it for them. So at least not harming them and hopefully also helping them in some ways. And then you try to expand that feeling or thought out to include as many people as you can. So all the people that you interact with in your life. So I think we find that by having this sort of strong positive motivation or reason for doing the meditation, it affects how the meditation goes. So then with that motivation, then we turn our attention to the breath and just observe the breath moving in and out. So it can be helpful to focus your mind particularly on the point just under the tip of your nose and on the sensation of the breath moving in and out past that point. So as I said, we're using mindfulness to keep that object of focus in mind, to keep the breath in our mind. So it's like remembering it, keeping it there. And then introspection is checking to see whether your mind has wandered off to other mental objects or whether it's staying there. So we're just trying to keep our focus just on that point. So it's sort of resting there. We don't need to use a lot of force, but we need to keep alert to be aware of when it starts to wander off.
can be helpful to count the breaths. Some people find that helpful, just starting from one and then keep counting up. So breathing in and out would be one breath. It can help to keep your mind focused. So if you find your mind wanders off, you just bring it back to the object. Just place it there. And remember mindfulness and alertness. Just try and keep it there on that point, on the breath. So now that we have developed some degree of concentration, we can use this concentration to observe the uh, afflictive mental states. So as I said, just try to bring to mind one of the mental afflictions or um, afflictive emotional states that you commonly feel. And so it could be anger, or it could be anxiety. Just the thing that tends to bother you the most. Craving or jealousy or... So the idea is just to bring it to mind and observe it without getting involved in it. So you might need to think of a situation, for example, where someone's insulted you and it's made you angry or someone's done something situation and just try to bring that to mind and just observe it so instead of focusing on breathing in this case we're focused on the emotion itself on that feeling we're just observing it
So it could be combined with some kind of physical feelings like sort of churned up in your stomach or in your chest. So you just observe those feelings as well. And the idea is we try not to get carried away with them, to get involved in, in those feelings, but just sort of observe them objectively in the same way as we're observing the breath before. Okay, so I'll just end the meditation there. Uh, so, any um, comments or um, questions about that meditation before we go on? Were you able to bring the uh, afflictive emotional state to mind? It's a bit hard to do, um, <laughs> unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah, and so then if you were, then were you able to, able to observe it um, objectively without sort of getting involved in it? <laughs> yeah, that's also tricky. But I think you can see that you can see the idea of, of doing that. And um, so I think there's quite a few, well, it's quite an interesting practice. Um, it could be, you might think, well, why would I want to do that? Aren't I supposed to be making my mind more peaceful? So why would I bring that afflictive sort of state to mind? So the idea is that you're not actually bringing the affliction into your mind, you're sort of ob observing it objectively. So which is quite a different thing, I think, to being totally absorbed in that, you know, that anger or resentment or stress or whatever it is. Because as you know, when these afflictive emotions come to mind, they tend to um, be, be consuming and we get very engrossed in them. And there's often a whole sort of story and scenario that goes with it. You know, so there's a something, something that someone did or, you know, thinking about, work-related stress and you're thinking about all the things that you've you've got to do that you haven't done the things that are running late you know the deadlines that are looming all these sort of things so there's all this story that goes with it but with that meditation we're sort of cutting through all of that story and just observing the um, afflictive mental state itself without getting involved in it And um, the idea is that just by doing that, just by observing it, it has the effect of pacifying it, which is an interesting idea. So because we're not um, giving it more power, not giving it more, um, not becoming engrossed in it and, and constantly r reminding ourselves of the reasons why we feel like that. So you're not constantly reminding yourself of that bad thing that someone did to you, not going over in your head. You're just bringing that emotion to mind and observing, observing it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, feel it, but also observe it. So I think there's a slight, maybe slight difference there. Um, yeah, I think feel it, yeah. Like when I was doing then, I was thinking of stress and then you feel sort of something in your stomach, that sort of feeling coming up. But you, and again, you sort of observe that, yeah. I've that um, yeah, good question. So, firstly, I think one thing it does is it changes your relationship with that afflictive, with that affliction. Let's call it affliction, afflictive mind. So, one thing is it shows that um, that afflict, afflictive mind is not me. Is one useful thing that it shows us. I think 
It's just something that arises in your mind because of certain causes and conditions. It comes up. So the analogy is often used as of the mind being like the sky and these thoughts coming through like clouds. And so some of the clouds are like, you know, dark storm clouds and others are white fluffy clouds. So the idea is that these are not your, not who you are. These are just things that are passing through your mind. So you, we tend to strongly identify with these afflict, afflictive mental states and think, you know, I am an angry person, this is my anger, this is angry me sort of thing, which is not helpful um, because it sort of gives, gives them more power and we feel more sort of, I think, trapped by them. That's the idea. There's one nice um, uh, analogy which comes from, I think, Su Sufism, Sufi tradition, where it says like when um, you, you treat all the emotions and thoughts that arise up as like guests in your guest house, and so you, s you sit them down and give them a cup of tea and have a chat to them and ask them you know, where they've been and where they came from and what are their plans and where they're going. So it's sort of like being interested in them and not scared of them, and just learning about them, sort of, without being particularly, you know, bothered by them. I think this is the idea. <laughs> so I think we tend to be quite scared of our aff afflictive emotions. They tend to be parts of ourselves that we really don't like and try and hide them and are, yeah, fearful of them. And so I think we tend to demonise them and make them stronger by doing that. So this is sort of doing the opposite of that. It's just observing them. Another example may be like a, a scientist examining a, a virus under a, a microscope. So they're just observing it with interest. And they're not, you know, shooting. They've got all their PPE on. They're not particularly scared of it. They're just observing it and seeing what it does and, and how it functions and, you know, how it operates under different circumstances, etc. So. so I think that's the idea with, with that. And as I was saying last week, the, these, the idea is that these, we call, use the word adventitious defilements. So the idea is that they're not in the nature of the mind and they're not permanent. So they, they come and go and the mind can be free of them, is the idea. And so what we're looking at this month is the idea that these afflictive states of mind arise because of certain um, ideas and concepts and beliefs that, that we hold. And when we examine all those beliefs and ideas that these afflictive states arise on, based on, we find that um, they're actually mistaken. So last week I was using the word delusion. and. We'll talk about this more, but the idea is that when we examine, we find that they're based on mistaken ideas. And because those ideas are mistaken, we, when we identify how they are mistaken, then we can, we can correct them. And so they, so they cease to become like powerful cause for these afflictive states to arise. That's the idea. That's what we're trying to achieve. Any more questions before we go? <laughs> so it's quite a big job, <laughs> but not too big. And I think uh, the more we do this, um, the more we learn about our mind and, and how it operates. So it's kind of a really, I think, a very interesting process and investigation. Okay. So last week, just sort of a, um, uh, so as I was saying last week, the idea, at least in the Buddhist thought, is that um, being happy is like our birthright. So we all, all deserve to be happy, like all the time. <laughs> so that's an interesting idea. I don't think we tend to think like that. I think we tend to think we don't deserve to be happy because I have all these faults and make all these mistakes. I don't actually deserve to be happy. But so the idea that you actually deserve to be happy uh, all the time is an interesting one. And, um, and also that these 
um, afflict afflictive states of mind are not something that we've chosen. You know, they're just something that are there in our mind because of these causes and conditions which are also there. So it's not like you started off your life thinking, I, I really want to be an angry person or I really want to, you know, experience, you know, anxiety. It's just that they arise because of causes and conditions. So it's not like we deserve to have them. So that's, a <coughs> that's an interesting idea. Um, so why don't we, why don't we feel happy all the time? And in the Buddhist explanation is because we have these um, things going on in our mind which are disturbing us, which are disturbing our peace. And so you might find sometimes your mind is really peaceful and you're not really sure why maybe. I'm not sure if you had that experience. Sometimes your mind just suddenly becomes very peaceful and you're not really sure why. And other times your mind can be really disturbed and you're not really sure why. You just feel very anxious or um, agitated or something like that. So there's, I think, quite a lot going on in our mind <clears throat> that we may be not aware of. And that's why these sort of practices of introspection can be very useful. And also having um, a framework in which to, we could use to investigate what's going on in our mind. So I remember a friend of mine saying um, she was interested in meditation, but she was really scared what she might find in her mind when she started to look. <laughs> she was saying, so, so how, do you, how do you work with that? She said, I don't even want to look at my mind because I just think this, it's like an ocean of stuff going on in there and I'd, I'd rather not even look at it. And so it's very helpful to have these kind of um, analytical frameworks to start to investigate your mind to see what's going on and then to start to identify, like before I was talking about attachment and aversion. So that a lot of what's going on in our mind is attachment and aversion. So we're sort of being drawn towards some things that appear attractive and other things that appear unattractive, we're sort of pushing them away. So it's interesting just to say, maybe walk through a, in our shopping mall maybe, and just as things appear to your mind, you label them uh, attractive or unattractive or indifferent is another category where you don't really have an opinion. So that's the of things in the shops and the people and the colors and shapes. and So having these kind of um, analytical frameworks is I think very helpful to start to um, understand what's going on in our mind. Um, so, uh, last week I mentioned this example which I think is a good um, illustration of the point that I'm trying to make here. And I'll just sort of go talk about that in more detail. So, I mentioned about a TV show called um, Go Back to Where You Came From, which you might have seen. And in that there were various people who started off uh, having been very strong um, sort of, um, you'd say, bigoted views um, of prejudice and hostility, you know, towards um, some refugees. This was in Australia. I think they've done it in other countries. And then they take these people on a journey with that person, with one of the refugees, and they go back with them um, like on the boat, for example, that they travelled on and back to the camp that they were in and back to their home country where, in this case it was in Africa, where there was a war going on and to the village that had been decimated by the war. And so it was a, a, a long journey of sort of discovery for the person who started off with these attitudes of prejudice and bigotry and slowly uh, understood that each of their the ideas they had were based on mistaken views about that person. So this is the idea of what we're trying to achieve in this, this sort of meditation, is to, to, to go back through, a, a s investigate the sort of layers of um, mistaken um, concepts. So you, you think about someone who has strong animosity towards um, a refugee, then part of that probably is like fear towards people or things that are unfamiliar, that look strange. So you can see how that is based on a, on a mistaken view. You know, it's only through getting to know the people they saw that they weren't actually strange. They were very much the same as, as, them, as themselves. Um, so that was one of the mistaken ideas 
views they had holding in their mind that people who are strange are somehow threatening. So that's a good example. And by learning about them, seeing that they were actually, you know, quite similar. So that fear um, went away. Um, and also ideas about how, where those people came from, that they were coming to my country to sort of take things away from me, take away our jobs or, you know, to live off our welfare and ideas like that. And understanding they weren't, that their, their situation, they weren't actually um, here by choice. They would have preferred to stay in their own country. So again, that was a mistaken view that they've come here trying to, you know, take something from us. So, yeah, you can see the point here that going through this sort of process of, of discovery and realizing one by one that their, their prejudices, prejudices and animosity that they held were based on these mistaken ideas. I think you can see that clearly. So that's kind of an extreme example, but I think you can see examples of that in your own life. You know, maybe not so, not so much with prejudice, but you know, with people that you don't like, for example, there's, we all have people in our life that we don't particularly like, but then you find that you get close to them and start to understand their situation and then learn about them, how see similarities between yourself and them, then they become less um, annoying perhaps. <laughs> You start to understand why why they are behaving the way that they are. So that's one example, I think, uh, and illustrates this point quite well. So you think about the, th like we were talking before about the afflictive state of mind which bothers you the most, and think about some of the ideas that that is based on. So it's investigating some of the assumptions or views that that afflictive state of mind is based on and trying to identify where, where those are perhaps mistaken. That's what we're trying to do. Um, so another example I was thinking of, which so I'm sort of taking fairly extreme examples because they illustrate the point well. Um, I was thinking of like extreme attachment or infatuation or obsession or um, so when someone is extremely attached to another person and to the point where they think that that person is, you know, having that person is the only thing that's going to make me, me happy, you know, being in a relationship with that person. And if I can't have that person, there's no way I can ever be happy. So we might have experienced something like that in our lives or have know people who have experienced that or we've experienced that to some degree and it might not be attachment to a person it can be attachment to to a thing to a I don't know a job or a, it can be anything we can get attached to almost anything so um, and then I was thinking of um, I'm not sure if you remember the or you know of the movie star in the 1920s called Rudolf Nure uh, Valentino. Yeah, so he was uh, probably one of the first heartthrobs in, in Hollywood cinema. I think he was Italian. It was in the 1920s. I think it was a silent movie. But, um, and he, he um, died quite young, about 30 suddenly, of a disease. And um, apparently there are f about f Apparently about five women committed suicide when he died, because he died, and one man, because there were... I guess it was be maybe because of the power of, of cinema at that time was a new thing and people were so... Um, became so obsessed by this um, screen idol. And I, th I think that's kind of an amazing an example of, you know, attachment and infatuation and obsession, that you could become that obsessed with a... It wasn't even a talking <laughs> actor, it was a silent screen actor. So that's kind of amazing. And uh, they, you know, at the funeral there apparently lines of people for ten blocks lining up to see his body and it's an extraordinary example of attachment. And So we can see, I think, clearly that that is an affliction you know, because it's self 
it's causing you to become self-destructive and it's obviously mistaken because he was just you know an ordinary person and so in their minds they totally exaggerated his you know what he what he was I mean feel free to disagree with me but it seems to me a good example of you know how a mind can become totally obsessed by by something to the point where it's self-destructive um, it, in Buddhism they often use the analogy of the, the moth and the flame so the moths are so attracted to the flame that they just keep flying towards it even though they keep getting burnt every time and they'll keep doing it until they, they die because their mind is just completely obsessed or overwhelmed by the attractiveness of the light so and again that's an extreme example but I think we can see that in our own in our own lives so what are some of the um, mistaken views when it um, in in that in that case so um, attachment is said to arise because of exaggerating the qualities of the thing that you're attached to so in that case exaggerating the qualities of Rudolf Valentino and thinking that he you know perhaps is like godlike or you know perfect in, in every way physically and mentally and we can see that you know when we become strongly attached to someone and attracted to them that we tend to think that they we, we overlook their their flaws <laughs> their faults and then maybe get disappointed later on when we <laughs> discover that they have flaws but um, so in Buddhist uh, meditation there's quite a lot of um, talk about analyzing the body because the body our own body and other people's body is something that we often attach to but when you examine what the body is and you look at all the parts of the body you know for example the skeleton and the muscles and the organs um, as one Buddhist teacher said it's hard to find anything in there that you could say is beautiful you know you, you grab the the tibia and the fibia and the femur and you wouldn't sort of regard any of them as something beautiful probably or the, the liver and the lungs so and the, that's what the body is it's, it's com composite of parts but when we're strongly attached to something like the body then we are sort of ignoring all of these the realities of that thing and we're projecting this sort of um, idealistic um, beautiful sort of essence on that thing and ignoring all the the unpleasant side of that thing of that object also the waste products that come from the body and the you know the blood and the all the various fluids that are going on in your body so we're ignoring ignoring all of those things so that but that's what the body is it's made up of all those things so that's a good example of of how our mind is um, sort of overwhelmed by this um, ideas that take over our mind that are based on mistaken on mistaken um, yeah mistaken views and then also with um, attachment we tend to exaggerate the experience so we think oh if only I had could be if I could marry um, Rudolf Valentino and um, we would live happily ever after and life would be bliss you know but we all know that rationally it's not that's not going to be the case you know there's going to still be plenty of problems even after you marry Rudolf Valentino um, but we tend to when we mind is a strong attachment we are ignoring the you know the faults of of the experience so the experience of the thing that we're attached to and we also ignore that it's p impermanent so we tend to think that it's something if only I could grab onto that person or that thing or that experience I could hold onto it and I'd be happy forever but when we analyze we can see that it's impermanent it's going to change you can be certain that it's going to change so that's two examples um, and probably I've talked enough now so maybe I'll turn it over to you if anyone has any questions and uh, as I said feel free to disagree I, I can keep talking but uh, I better not talk, talk all night so any thoughts on that um, can you see how with attachment for example how that is based on mistaken 
view. Do you agree with that? Yes, got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so good question. So you're saying like those examples of, of feeling stress, for example, about your your work or maybe stressed about yeah, a loved one who's, you know, yeah. So you're saying it's not delusional because they're, they're real, that they're, they're really happening. Yeah, so the thoughts are real. Yeah, that's true. They definitely are. We're, we're experiencing them and they're painful. So there's no doubt that, that they're definitely happening. But the idea here is that the reason they're arising, or, or this is a question I guess, are they arising based on a correct um, understanding of the situation? Or are they arising because of some mistaken views we have about the situation? So that's the question. So in the case of you know, R Rudolf uh, Valentino, so we could see that the people who were so obsessed with him to the point where they would kill themselves, we can see that's obviously a mistaken projection going on in their mind, that they had some very exaggerated, inflated view of his specialness. So you'd agree with that. So, so that's the kind of, when I say delusion, and I'm not sure delusion is the best word, but it's, it's something that is appearing very vividly in their mind and they're completely believing it, in it about his specialness, for example, and his beauty and his desirability and that's completely uh, overtaking their mind, you know, to the point where they, you know, become self-destructive. So that's what we mean by delusion. So it's a mistaken view. Someone else would look at him and just think, well, he's just a guy, you know, he's nothing special. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about here. And in the case of the person with strong prejudice and bigotry and animosity towards someone because they're foreign or, you know, because of um, xenophobia. Um, so you can also see how that is based on mistaken ideas that they have about that person, you know. They've got some idea about that person being a threat because they're different or unusual or they've come from somewhere else. I think it's fairly clear we can see that those are mistaken views. So that's what we mean by delusion. Yep. And then, then there's sort of layers of those views. Like, as I said, with attachment, we, it's based on the idea of permanence. So we're also projecting permanence onto that object we're attached to. We're ignoring the fact that it's changing from moment to moment. And we're also ignoring the fact that our experience of that object is changing from moment to moment. So you know with an object of attachment, something you've you know, wanted for a long time and then when you get it it's kind of new and shiny for a while but after a while it starts to fade and it's no longer the new shiny beautiful thing it's just your old pair of shoes that <laughs> used to be your fabulous fabulous new shoes so that's impermanent so when we're str having strong attachment to something we're ignoring that reality about it too that's the idea here mm. Yeah. 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 So are you saying that stress is a uh, inevitable are part of work life for example like do you have to have stress
Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I think um, certainly stress is common and something we all experience and it'd be very hard to find someone who hasn't experienced any stress, you know, if not just work related but also family related or to with relationships or anything. Um, but if you think about the reason that I, they arise, so again this is the question we're asking, like think of example, for example you have a deadline coming up that you can't meet or you're worried that you can't meet it, you've got to get certain things done by a certain date and it doesn't like, look like you're going to be able to do it, so you start to feel anxious about that because you know that other people are relying on you to do it and they're expecting you to do it and they'll be disappointed if you don't and you've um, promise to do it and all those sort of things. So then the question is um, does that situation have to be stressful? Does it have to be painful? And do you have to feel anxiety? So I think the, the Buddhist answer would be no, you don't. You can have that situation and not feel stress. So there's a reason why you're feeling stressed in that situation but it's not inherent to that situation. I was thinking of an example, um, I saw a documentary about uh, the Dalai Lama and he was on an international tour and he was going to visit one country, I think it may be Germany or it was just maybe Eastern European country and at that time the foreign minister of that country was, was visiting China so suddenly it was politically embarrassing for that country for him to go there but that people, thousands of people had spent many months organising this event, volunteers, huge amount. So then he's in this dilemma and he just said, I can't go. It's bad for that country, bad for the relationship, it's, it's all, I can't go. And then the people who were interviewing said, well, isn't that going to be terribly disappointing and such a huge waste of money and for, for those people and won't they be really upset? And he said, yeah, they will be, yeah. And so I said, well, doesn't that bother you? Like, and he said, I can't do anything about it. So that's it. Move on. So I thought that was a really good example of someone who's very clear in their mind about what they were doing and was able to make a decision with huge gravity and just sort of move on. So, okay, I can't do anything, move on. So, uh, like he often says that, if there's something you can do about a situation, then you should do it. Does it, there's no need to worry about it, you just do what you can. If there's nothing you can do to fix it, then there's no point worrying, because there's nothing you can do. So in, in that sort of analysis, the worrying is completely like um, unnecessary. So then why do we do it? That's the question. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. So I th yeah. Yeah, that's a good example. I think because what you're doing there is sort of analyzing the importance of of the problem. And so problems are always relatively important. So, you know, as people often say in my work, we're not saving babies here. We're just... <laughs> so so what, when something goes wrong, how important is it? How big is the problem? So you, you can analyse that and step away, as you say, step away from it. And a week later you look back and think, well, it wasn't really that important. But people, in the, the, particularly in the workplace, tend to really magnify problems. Suddenly they're hugely important missing this deadline or um, making this mistake. And some people, you know, they sort of look at, say looking at the stars helps them to keep things in perspective. So it's that kind of idea. You realise how tiny our problems are when you look at the size of the, you know, the galaxy, for example. Or you compare it to the sort of problems that other people have in other parts of the world, you know, living in war zones, for example. So it's a 
Yeah, like you say, it's, an, it's a form of analysis and the conclusion of the analysis is that this problem is, is not such a big problem. So that's a way of dealing with the, the stress. So that's another example of a mistaken view where we're exaggerating the importance of the problem. So it's like the opposite of attachment, we're exaggerating the good quality. With this example of stress, we're exaggerating the, the problem. Yeah. There's many examples of that. I mean, I could look at a young person with a failed relationship and watch them go through acne and realise this will pass, this will pass. But for them, it's very real. But I can't convince them that now I might worry that I'll suicide or, and it's completely beyond my control. But I look, I look at unjust things and think this is unfair. And yet I've got to come to accept that because I, uh, even though I might analyse it and see it's out of perspective, it's not right, I, I'm not going to change it. So that's a yeah. thing for, you know, it's, it becomes more reasonable. People with a sense of fair play, oh, that's not right. And, but yeah, it's beyond us to do anything. Yeah, that's a really good point, yeah. So I think that's, again, that comes down to techniques like um, mindfulness and alertness. So we need to sort of take um, control over what our mind is focusing on. And as you say, you could spend a lot of time focusing on a problem that you can't do anything about. You can't fix this, you know, for example, another person's problem. You, you, know, you, may, you may have tried everything that you could, and then still it's there, and still you can keep trying, but there's a point where you have to be realistic about what you can do and can't do. And then there's no point um, worrying about something that you, you can't change, is there? So I think a good example is, um, you know, with the climate, uh, you know, crisis. So I, I, some of my friends seem to, it becomes a point where it's actually causing them depression and anxiety just thinking about it all the time and so it's it's counterproductive it's not helping them to solve the problem it's actually doing the opposite and um, I saw a documentary about a climate scientist who became extremely depressed to the point where he couldn't you know work anymore he had to retire so it's 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 of course we understand you know what like he would be going through but it's not helpful to be thinking, keep bringing these things into our mind if all it's doing is harming us and not helping us to solve the problem. So we need to be sort of careful about what our, we occupy our minds with, you know. Like I don't really, you know, watch the news much because I find it just makes me upset. <laughs> And it's sort of like a roundup of the ten worst things that have happened in, you know, the, the, today. You know, I find it more interesting to sort of look in, in, in depth to those, the real story of, you know, like the war in Ukraine, for example, to really understand the people, what they're going through and, um, you know, on both sides. And rather than just hearing about, you know, how many bombs were dropped today, it just you know, doesn't really help to know, I don't think. Yeah, so that's a good point. So that's another important use of meditation, I think, choosing what your, occupies your mind. So we have a choice about what our mind, what we, our mind focuses on. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, it's said that your last thoughts at the end of the day tend to affect your whole night. So your mind tends to keep those thoughts. So if you can go to sleep with a happy, peaceful mind, it's going to affect. <laughs> <laughs> <You've got to laughs> yeah. Yes. So what do you think she got from that? Like, or oh, why did that make her feel better or make the experience more enjoyable? Mm. Yeah, that reminds me of there's one meditation you can do where you just observe the object of the f objects of the five senses. Oh. That's quite a nice meditation. Was you just think about the, what you're feeling on your body, and then what you're hearing, and then um, yeah, any taste you have, and etc. So just run through those five. So it's a bit similar, I think. You're sort of making an inventory of just observing. Yeah, of not, and you're not really getting involved in them. You're just observing them. So yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, so we're out of time now, so thanks very much for listening and um, see you next week. Let's please stay for tea if you would like. <laughs>